If I run late, it's his fault. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Mark. And uh, I got this message from Wednesday. Someone asked me, uh, how was Wednesday night message? I went, send me. <laughs> no, it was excellent. It was awesome. And it provoked me a certain things. We're going to go over a little bit of the same scripture Brother Simi brought Wednesday, and there's things that just stuck in my mind, and I just can't get rid of it. I just can't, you know, put it aside, and, and that's because of good preaching. It really is. And he preaches so often, and there's a lot of things that motivate me and show me things, and then I have to preach it. <laughs> but that's what it's about. So uh, I appreciate Brother Simi and the message. Wednesday, it really, really inspired me and helped me. And it showed me something I'd never seen before. I'm like, wow, I like that. that. I think that's the best part of preaching was when you're studying and you see things and things are made clear and you're like, you know, it's never happened. It, it does happen, though. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, wow, this is incredible. So if you will take your Bibles and stand with me in honor of God's word, we're going to be, again, in Mark chapter 10. And these verses should be uh, uh, familiar. We're going to start in verse 17, uh, chapter 10 of Mark says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the events ahead there, Lord, the fellowship, the food, and we thank you for fellowshipping with us. I mean, you could do that through your word as well. When we read your word, we're hearing your voice, we're hearing your thoughts. And, Lord, we need to take heed, and we need to understand what you're trying to tell us. And, Lord, uh, it's about your cause. And, Lord, uh, our cause is not your cause. It should be. We need help with that. So, Lord, as we go over this story, dear Lord, of this poor man and the rich man, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Lord, uh, you have so much to offer. And we'd be foolish not to accept. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think almost all of us here are pretty aware of this story. And, and there's three parts to this story that I want to talk about. There's three parts. And I think we all concentrate and hear preaching and teaching and reading about the first part. But we never really talk about the rest of it. And... Uh, so I want to do an illustration. I think I'm going to do an illustration. Carter? That's, it's Carter, right? Come up here. Justice. Come over here. So forgive me. Uh, when you got siblings and most of them's first names start with the same letter, I get confused. You know, just like, and you got about a new Campbell every 10 months, and that really doesn't help things. So just bear with me, all right? So this is Carter. And he's going to represent the poor man, okay? He's got 10 brothers and sisters. He's probably poor. So, anyway, this is Justice. I mean, look at him. Look at him. Is he snazzy? He looks, he looks rich, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's probably rich. Anyway, so this is our illustration. We've got poor man and rich man. Now, I want to pretend to be the Lord, the Lord Christ Jesus. I'm just going to pretend. 
And you know what? We all should be like him. And here comes Jesus. And he's got his cross. Now, you all stay where you are until I tell you to get in your seat, okay? Hey, come follow me. And the rich man, let me ask you something. I mean, the poor man here. What's he got to lose? What's he got to lose? You don't see much messages on this because they have nothing to lose. They got everything to gain, all right? But get that rich man. Hey, come follow me. Come follow me. And what's he going to do? He's going to shake his head and like, I don't think so. Mm, not for me. He's got everything to lose. Am I right? Everything. But here's what we don't realize. He says, follow me. Take up thy cross and follow me. Whoa. That's a whole other thing. That is different. Because these two are aware of the process that someone goes to Calvary. Hey, take that cross and follow me. By the way, I'm head of the Calvary. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to have be sacrificed, and it's not going to be easy. But we don't capture that part. Hey, take that cross. Follow me. He doesn't even hear that part. He's worried about his stuff. He's worried about his things so much that that doesn't mean that. But you know what we left out? You receive treasures in heaven. This stuff is nothing. Whoa, I got something better for you. Treasure is there. But, and he's going to get a lot of treasure. Very understand this and know this, biblically. But, take up that cross and follow me. Whoa, time out. <laughs> um, hmm, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. So what does that reference? Sacrifice. It's sacrifice. It's sad. Sacrifice. Hey, you can accept the Lord. You can have treasures in heaven. You can have eternal life. But there is a price. You don't, hey, look, you don't have to go die. I'm going to do that. But you're going to suffer. Hey, you don't have to die. I'm going to do that. But you may suffer. Hmm. So this young man, this rich man, he's like, I got everything I want, everything I need right here, and now you want me to suffer, and then you want, and that's going to go away, and you might even really get treasures in heaven. Huh. Let me ask you something. Why do you think and suppose that people want their things so much or want things so much? I have an idea. Oh, if I just had this, I have more friends. If I just had that, people will look up to me. If I just had that, and you can go on and on and on. And God says, if you want me, and everything will be all about me, you don't need all those things. Wow. Simple. God doesn't want all that stuff in the way. Because he wants you just the way you are. There's some things that can be fixed. Don't get me wrong, but that's through his power. But it's about sacrifice. Have a seat. Thank you, sirs. So you see here in this message, sell all you have. What's laid up for you in heaven, the treasure in heaven is going to be laid up for you. But there's going to be sacrifice. And it's tough. I'm going to shorten this up because I know we don't, we'll be here to two if I'm not careful. You know, so there are situations in the Bible that we see that people suffered for the Lord. And let me ask you this. Just, have you suffered for the Lord? Really? 
Some people can say yes. There have been situations, I'm not going to go into them, the details of it, and that I can, I can honestly tell you, it, it, it was a struggle. Now, I think of this. I think of this one person turned to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 8. And Stephen, oops, wait, that's my name. Uh Uh-oh, I got to think about that. (laughs) Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cenarians and the Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and uh, Asia, disputing with Stephen. Stephen knew his stuff. And when they were not able to resist this wisdom, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake, then they suburned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemies, words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witness, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemy, words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as had been the face of an angel. That's pretty impressive. I have to say, I wish I was more like Stephen. To have a testimony, a power, a boldness, a confidence to show people what they need to know. And I lack. I really do. I think we all do. Because in chapter 7, they stone him. You know, I, I look around and I don't see any stones. I look around and I don't see any scars. I, don't, I look around and I don't see any of us, you know, suffering death because of anything. Except for natural stuff. But here's Stephen. He was just doing what he does. Very special person. And I think his delivery and his boldness and his confidence was so strong, so intimidating. These people didn't like it. Because there's there's a part of the message in here in uh, verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered. Now, what is he talking about? Now, in the synagogues there, I'll tell you what's going on, very briefly. Look at me. What do you think you're doing? You can't do that. You can't do this. You're going to follow me. Follow what I do, what I believe, what I say. So we know the laws of Moses, it's there to show us one thing. You sin. There's consequences. That's what the law does. It points out sin in our lives. It points out that we can't be righteous. It points out that we need someone that is righteous, Christ Jesus. It points that out. But what they did is they encapsulated the same. We, we can use this to help us be righteous on our own terms and our own selves. And then what they ended up doing was this. Well, the law says this, so what contributes to that, breaking that specific law? And you know what they do? They created other laws. They have their own books of laws that help support and for us to understand and not to break the law of God. And you know what that all ended up being? Power. Power. They had power. That's sad. The Lord says, I want you to be free. 
be free. And yet, here you see these people of the synagogues, and it was all about power. He's like, hey, he's going to mess everything up. He's going to bring and introduce these things, and we have no part of that because it pretty much leaves us out and takes away our power. We can't have him do that. So what are they going to do about it? Stone them. Let's get rid of them. I don't think there's any of us here that are in jeopardy of being stoned to death. But that's extreme. That's far extreme. And that's what happened to Stephen. Because of his testimony and his witness and his sacrifice. And I got to thinking, I'm like, man, I'll tell you what. What a powerful testimony of Stephen. There's much more. If you want to look in Acts chapter 6 and 7 and look in further, you'll learn more about him. And uh, uh, it's just, it's sad. But at the same time, when he was dying, he said, not let the sin be upon them. Wow. How? Because he knew it was all about him, the Lord, not himself. So this reminds me of another story. So, you know, just because the rich man were to accept Christ and the poor man were to accept Christ and follow him, doesn't always mean there's going to be strife and struggle in your life. It doesn't. It's not plain and clear that it's going to happen for sure. Maybe it does, but let me ask you this. Have you ever thought of this? Something comes in your life, and it's a struggle, and it's a sacrifice, and you say, you know what? It's worth it. Oh, wait a minute. So uh, this is something hard for me to get a hold of and, and to learn about and understand, but it's coming, and it's getting better and better, that when I have a struggle in my life, opportunity. It's opportunity to witness, to show the glory of God to others. And that others would see, hey, that guy follows Christ, that guy does this, and, got this. and you can tell it's worth it. I think of Paul and Silas. Wow. Thrown in prison. And it was not even legally correct because they come to learn that they were citizens of Rome. And it was a no-no because they skipped a whole bunch of process, right? <laughs> they just threw them in there because they're God's people. Uh, they're Jews. And, and when they're in prison, right, they're like, hey, let's make the best of it. This is opportunity. I mean, see, all of you that know the story, Paul and Silas, do you see any time where they're like, oh, this is horrible. You can't find it. Oh, this, this is, this is going to be bad. You can't find it. Because they're following him. They're letting him, Christ, lead. And if God sends you to a place and he puts you there, you're in a good place. You're not in a bad place. You're in a good place. So another message I preached several years ago. And we don't look at it that way. And here they are. They're bound. They're bound. And they're like, hey, let's pray a little bit. I'm saying a little bit, and, you know, and the jailer was asleep, and things started to shake up, didn't it? Brother Alex, it shook them up. It was so bad, the jailer was awakened. It's dark. Goes and gets a light and thinks of killing himself. Because if everything's broken apart this loose, they've got to be gone. And they said, whoa, it's okay. We're still here. And the jailer realizes they cared about him. They cared about him. Look, no matter what place you end up, because you're following the Lord, it's really not about you. It's about the cause of Christ. And it's about them. It's all about helping them. And so here we got Paul and Silas. He's like, hey, it's okay. We're still here. And look at what happens. What must I do to be saved? Because he sees this witness and this testimony from them like, hey, this person cares about me. This has got to be of God. What happened in this miracle 
is about him. Not necessarily them, but because of him. Wow. Wow. I want to wrap this up. They, their government figures out, um, oops, we imprisoned our own citizens. And they call for them to come and leave. And you know what Paul says? Is, we like it here. <laughs> We're going to stay a little bit. Um, by the way, if you want me to, us to leave, you're going you're to kind of come and get us yourself. And they did. <laughs> How? How is it? We see the story. You see what happens to them. And they're like, and the whole different spectrum of what we think and understand what is bad. I don't know about you. I don't want to go to jail or prison. I just don't. I'm not, I'm not volunteering. But I'll tell you what. If I'm in the Lord's will and the Lord leads and I end up there, it is his will. It is a good place. And I have to keep that in mind. And remember that. Wow. How about another story? Peter. He was in prison. And while he was in prison, there was a prayer service going on, wasn't there, brother? They were, they were praying for him. And you see the angel of the Lord and, and the Lord working, and the Lord gave him exit out of this prison and all its details. He, out of the prison. So he shows up at the prayer party. He shows up. And Rhonda, is it Rhonda? Yeah, Rhonda shows up. And this is how the practice was during the day, especially those that had more money and wealth and whatever. They would hear that. And they would go up to the door. Who is it? And that person would say, it is I. Not their name. And if that person recognized their voice, they would answer the door. But that didn't happen. <laughs> Who is it? It is I. And she was like, wait a minute. Um, Peter's at the door. <laughs> um, Peter's at the door. And, and you know what? They thought she was crazy. They did. They're like, what are you talking about? This, that, no way. No way. He's at the door. And then they answered it. Wow. And Peter doesn't even stay. He says, I'm heading out. <laughs> He's got work to do. Hey, I wonder if you thought... What's my next opportunity? So you see, in this case, he's encouraging the believers. Paul and Silas, he's encouraging the lost. Peter is encouraging the believers. I wonder how many of you go, I can't believe this. You ever had that thought? I can't believe it. Through God, everything's possible, isn't it? I want to end with this. In both situations, they were released from prison. What is your prison? What prison do you still have that stops you from following him the way you're supposed to? So, the rich man his prison was the things that he had. It was keeping him away from the Lord. That's a whole different type of prison. But we do have prisons. That's why the Bible is talking about why it's so hard for the rich man. He has something to lose. But what we, they fail to understand is this. There's so much to gain. There's so much to gain. Wow. Because here's the way I look at it. Everything that the Lord puts me through 
and uses me to help others is worth it. It means something. It will be for eternal. But these things, from this first part, these things, they're going to go away. They're going to cease to exist. So I ask you, what is your prison? Because the rich man had things, and you know what? I, I like to think of it this way. He was in bondage. Things will bind you from doing what the Lord wants you to do. And here we see these two cases where their faith and their willingness to follow him we see great things happen. We see people saved. We see people encouraged. Let me ask you something. I know I fail at this. Who do you encourage? What is your prison that's in the way of that? Because we all have them. And do we follow him the way we should? Very simple. True story. I thank you, Brother Simi, for your message. It inspired this that that uh, that provoked me, and I enjoy that. I enjoy where God shows me something. And you know, uh, he he talked about me. It's hard putting messages together. Sometimes. I mean, it's there's and I, and I did back to back this morning. So I did Sunday school and this morning's message. And he does that all the time. And uh, I tell you, the most part of that is the emotion that goes with that. It does. It, it, it gets tiring. It does. It's worth it. My poor wife, her dog passed away Wednesday, and uh, uh, so she's tired. Just emotionally drains you. But it's worth it. Some may even say that's a, you know, that's a sacrifice. It's worth it. It's worth it. Let us pray. Lord, Father, we thank you for this morning, we thank you for the freedom that you show us to serve you, to, to get uh, treasure in heaven. It's all there. It's all for the taking. But it does come a little sacrifice, and in some cases more than others. But, Lord, uh, it's worth it. To have the opportunity in our lives to say, I gave glory to God for these things and for these situations. Wow. I wonder how many can actually say that they do that, they give honor and glory to God for everything, even though it seems bad or good, do we actually do it? Pastor. If you'll please stand with me. Altars are open, believers. Be mindful of what the Lord spoke to you about today. <clears throat> Maybe you're here today and you say, Brother Justin, I don't, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I come in the building today. Maybe you thought you were saved or maybe you knew you weren't, but you would now say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. And I know I need him. Uh, the, the story here... Jesus was not telling him a recipe to, to have eternal life. He was trying to point out to him that he was a covetous person and that he was a sinner. And if you're going to follow Jesus, obviously you're going to believe on him. You're going to be willing to be identified with him. And so um, he couldn't get over his riches to come to Christ. And if you're going to have eternal life today, if you're going to know Jesus and have his forgiveness, then, then you have to believe on him. You have to admit you're a sinner and believe what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection was enough to pay for your sins. You have to receive that by faith. And so if that's you today, I want to encourage you. I want to help you that way. Um, no reason for you to go another day with, without eternal life, without knowing Christ, without being free, because um, every lost person's in prison they're in prison. Uh, we're bound, bound in sin. 
so you can be free today. Believers, you don't have to be bound today, but you might be bound today because we still have this flesh. It wasn't saved when your soul was saved. Your flesh wasn't saved. Um, and you can still be bound. And you are if you're not following the Lord. You might say, no, I'm not bound. But you are. You're still bound. You don't have to be. The Bible says we can put ourselves back under the yoke of bondage. Are you willing to forsake the temporal for the eternal today? Something temporal that's keeping you from the eternal. That's our battle. That's your battle. That's my battle. This flesh is temporal. The spirit's eternal. And we struggle with those. You have so much to gain. And you have so much more to gain than you have to lose. Most people look at it the opposite way. I have too much to lose. And I don't believe Christ can be any gain to me more than what I already have. Then you're going to stay bound in your prison. You're going to stay bound in your yoke that you're yoked up in, in your bondage. But you don't have to. You don't have to. You can follow Christ and you don't have to stay bound. Maybe you, you're not sure if you, you're bound or not. Why don't you just talk to the Lord about it? Lord, am I bound? Is something binding me? I need you to reveal to me. I need you to show me. You probably already know, though. But just be honest with the Lord. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that you care enough about people. You care about this rich man to come by and answer his question. And to invite him to follow you. He chose not to. He was very grieved. And he should have been because he's kicking against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And your calling in his life. Now I... I don't know if this man ever made that right and ever followed you, Lord, but as far as we know from your word, he did not. He maybe never saw you again. But, Father, we're thankful that you care for people. You give us the opportunity. You afford us eternal life through your sacrifice that you took up your cross that was really our cross to pay for our sin. So if there's one here today, Lord, that doesn't know you, would they just get that settled today? And Father, as one of your children, Father, we need your help, we need your strength, we need your power, your Holy Spirit to break free from any bondage that we have in our life. So please uh, speak to us loud and clear, and that may we respond with great liberty today in this matter. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for how you work, and we love you, Lord, and we pray you'll bless the time of fellowship we're about to have and the food we're going to eat, and we pray you'd help us to live for you today, in spite of our circumstances, in spite of all the things that surround us, because you are, you're worthy, and if we can just gain your presence and your power in our life and, and walk with you, Lord, that's great gain. And so help us to be content in our life with what you've given us and what you're doing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.